Do you know as much as 50% of the cost of frame comes from connections and joints? A proper design and fabrication of connections and joints is absolutely critical. In this lecture, you will learn design process for connections and joints using Eurocode 3. This is part 17 of lecture series on steel design. For other parts, have a look at description down below. Hey friends, if you're new here, I am Dr. Javed Qureshi, a senior lecturer at a London university. On this channel, we explore technical and human skills to help us lead more productive, happy and examine life. Connections and joints are the most important one in any building and they are the weakest link in a building. So proper design of connections and joints is extremely important. But in the UK, mainly the joints are designed by fabricators. They are not designed by structural designers, unless if you are working in a very small firm, in which case the connections and joints will be designed by a structural engineer. But most of the time, these joints are designed by fabricators. Fabricators means people who fabricate the connections, who manufacture the connections, who manufacture the, the systems. This is how the presentation is organized. The first introduction to connections and joints, and then type of joints, then joint modeling. Sufficient information is given in, in Euro code 3 part 18 for a non-composite steel frame and that steel frame could be simple or rigid. So we assume that it's a non-composite steel frame. The columns are not composite. The connections are not composite. And the code that deals with these joints is Eurocode 3 part 18. And for design of buildings, we have Eurocode 3 part 11. Now this code for design of joints, it is as much as 50% longer than the one for buildings, which means that joints are really important. I would like to define these two terms. Previously, in the past, connections and joints, they were treated similarly. And in most of the other countries as well, North America, they are still used interchangeably. But there's a key difference between connection and joints. Eurocode define a connection as a location at which two or more elements meet. It means that if two plates are connected, that is a connection. The joint itself is a zone where two or more members are interconnected. So here you can see that two or more members are interconnected. This is a connection between two members and you can see that here this web panel is going to be in shear as well. So this is part of the joint. So if I say joint, then I will have to incorporate the entire behavior of the joint. Again, this is a double sided joint. It means that on two sides you have uh, some connecting elements. This part two is a connection. This is a connection between a beam and a column. Again, this is a connection between beam and column. Part three is components and part one is web panel and shear. So web panel is going to be in shear as well when you apply this loading. There are five topics in Eurocode part one eight design bases, fasteners, roll of joints and then design for H and I sections and joints between a structure hollow sections. 50% cost of the frame comes from joints. So it is very important that joints are designed properly. And the way industry works is that people would like to use the standard components. This figure, it is giving you the view of different joints, which I will talk about in a minute. The key thing to be noted here is that there is a slight gap between column and beam. Whenever you are leaving a gap between a column and beam, it will allow rotations. So the concept of simple or pin joints is that when we apply loading it will allow some kind of rotation if it is not allowing rotation if it is connected rigidly if a beam is connected rigidly with the column then it is going to generate some kind of moments for a moment not to happen at the joint it is necessary that it should rotate at the top, you can see that these are double web cleated joints. And in the middle, you can see that this is partial depth end plate joint, which is the most common one. This is the one that we use most of the time in the UK. Third one is fin plate joint. So you, you weld a fin plate to the column and then you connect it to the beam here. But this type of joint, although I mean, this is a fin joint, but this is not very common in the UK. And the reason is that because it allows out of the plane deformations here, the beam ends could be subjected to torsion. So that's why we don't use 
use this joint quite a lot in the UK. Then we have these rigid joints. The rigid joints, on the other hand, they transfer moment from the beam to the column. That is the reason that we will need to design columns as beam columns if it is taking moment due to rigidity of joints. Now here you can see that this is wind moment connection. What is happening here is that this is extended depth and plate connection, welded connection, and then your column splices as well. And at the top, you can see these bolted joints. Now the trouble is that it will make the connections very complicated and it will increase the cost of the connection. And also you will have to carry out the rigid analysis. Mainly it will increase the cost of the framing. These two books are very important. One is joints in simple construction, other is moment resistant joints. Methods of connections, because we have various methods of connections available, we prefer using standard connections. The standard connections that we use in the UK have M20 grade 8.8 .8 bolts. This is the grade of bolt and with 22 mm dia, the diameter of the hole has to be greater than diameter of the bolt when you're connecting it. And usually it is between 1.6 to 2 millimeter, but here, we will take it as two millimeter most of the time. Fillet wheels, when we weld plates, six or 8 mm leg length and fittings usually S275 steel and here you have got different bolt sizes the key thing to remember here is that how do you work out the yield of these bolt grades for 8.8 grade its ultimate FU is going to be 8 this 8 times 100 so ultimate is going to be 800 and if you multiply this 800 with 0.8 you will get 640 so yield will be this 0.8 times 800. In this case, yield for 10.9 bolts, ultimate will be 10 times 100, which will be 1000, and the yield is going to be 0.9 times 1000 which will give you 900. So in that case, you will remember that what is yield and ultimate for these bolts. Grade 8.8 .8 bolts are the most common ones. But nowadays, 10.9 is becoming common as well because if you have very high strength steel, then we want to ensure that bolts do not fail. Plates, they fail all the time. Black versus high strength friction bolts. Now this is an example of black bolts. In black bolts, the load is transferred by bolt bearing or shear in the bolt. And here in high strength friction bolts, bolts you can see that it has got a specialized washer so when we try to tighten this bolt these embossments that you see here they disappear and the force is transferred by friction and we use high strength friction bolts not in buildings but we use it most of the time in bridges now joints and braced frame now these are the joints and i would like to show you this video horizontal wind loads are transferred to the foundations through diagonal bracing there are many different configurations of bracing, but all look to use triangulation to transfer the loading. Wall and roof bracing is normally provided in selected bays, often at the end of buildings. Additional vertical columns or beam sections may be introduced at the gables or wind posts to support cladding on end walls. So this was giving us information about bracing, how do we use bracing, and here you can see that these are different types of joints. We idealize braced frames as simple construction. So in simple construction means the, the joints are nominally pinned, and you saw earlier how do these nominally pinned joints look. And this means that the moment is not transferred to the joints. And then we have joints with shear wall. For multi-story construction, the horizontal forces from wind applied to the structure can be very onerous. A number of options are available to transfer these loads to the foundations. These are braced frame, the use of diagonal bracing within the structure to transfer the horizontal loads. Bracing will usually be restricted to the core area containing stairwells, lifts and toilets. Reinforced concrete core. Cast in situ concrete is used to form the core. Structural steelwork and floor plates are used to transfer the loads to the core. So this was framed with shear walls. These are column base plates. So this is again a different type of joint. It begins with the columns at ground level. There are a variety of ways of connecting column base plates to concrete ground structures. One common method involves casting holding down bolts in pockets into the concrete. The pockets allow minor horizontal adjustments of the bolts. Vertical adjustment is by shims or packs inserted between the base plate and the top surface of the concrete. After the column is positioned, the base is grouted in, 
filling the pockets and any voids beneath the base plate. The number and arrangement of the bolts forming the joint is determined by the design and is dependent on whether a fixed, pinned or semi-pinned connection is required. Now, this slide is very important. These are beam to column joints. Now, the top one that you see is double web cleated joints where there are two web angles, leg angles, which are connected to the end of the beam. And this is the elevation and this is the section. And these are called termed as double angle web cleats. No welding is required. And then you bring these leg angles to the side and then you bolt it to the web of the beam and then you bolt it to the flange of the column. And in that way, you form uh, this joint. The key thing to note here is that there is always going to be a gap of 10 to 12 millimeter to allow for rotation. That makes the joint pin joint as a simple joint. And then the second one is a pin plate connection. Now here you can see that a plate is welded to the column flange and then it is bolted to the beam web. This is fin plate. This is not very common. Double angle web cleats. These days, this is becoming a little obsolete as well. The reason is that you will have to bring it to the site and then you have to connect it. The advantage of end plate, partial depth end plate connection or flexible end plate connection is that you pre-weld this plate to the end of the beam and then you bring it to site and then simply all you need is bolts. So simply bolt it to the column flange. And generally in the UK, you will come across end plated joints quite often, to be honest. Now, key thing in all of them is that there is a gap here. This gap allows the rotation, which means that the joints are nominally pinned. And in next slide, I'll show you some simple joints. Then uh, you will understand the examples. This sheer, simple or pin connection only attaches the web of the beam to the column. It allows the flanges to freely rotate. And this was double web angle joint. This is a pin joint and this one. Many options are available in detailing connections in multi-story construction. And we'll look at a number of typical joint details. Thin plate connections are simple connections and are often used to connect beams to columns or beams to concrete cores. Fin plate connections are fabricated by welding a single plate to the column. Beams are normally attached using two or more bolts. Where necessary, adjustment can be provided using slotted holes. For instance, horizontally slotted holes in the web of the section attached to the fin plate. Now, these kind of fin plate joints, they are not very commonly used. The reason is that they can rotate out of the plane quite easily right so that's the reason we don't use them quite often here yeah. then these are some kind of bracing joints horizontal bracing gusset plate and vertical bracing these are some of the patterns on how beam to beam joints are connected so primary secondary beam configuration most of the time you will have end plated joints as the common one so you will have plate welded to the end of the beam sometimes you use this double web cleat as well what are the benefits of standard connections again there are lots of benefits here i'm not going into details these are uh, given for you to read resistance tables now resistance tables are very important they are given in green books most of the times if you don't have much time you have your chosen beams and columns and then you just simply have have a look at the green books these two green books one for simple other for moment joints simply you use the standard connections here this is end plate connection this is a fin plate connection so when secondary beam is notched we have similar tables for double web pleated connections and partial depth end plate connections so you can see that if the beam is this one the fin plate is welded to the column so column could be any column then it will tell you that single notch will carry number of bolts if you have six bolts it will carry this much of loading it will tell you the support requirements and then it will tell you the tying requirements as well so tying capacity here it's giving you all the information so mainly we design the joints for shear these are shear joints so simple joints are shear joints they only transfer shear force or axial force they don't transfer any moment now you have have similar resistance tables for other types of joints pin plate dimensions this is for robustness or structural integrity notch means if you have the top flange of the beam chopped off then you have rigid frames in rigid frames you can see that these are all types of rigid frames they allow transfer of moments and in this lecture i will not go into details of design of these rigid frames it is covered in green book which is moment joints and again these are different types of rigid joints it means that beams are rigid 
rigidly connected to the columns and there is no gap between end of the beam and the column. If there is a gap, it will allow rotations and as a result, a joint is going to be simple, pinned or a hinged joint. And again, I will show you some videos and that will make things really very clear. End plate beam to column connections are common for moment transfer joints. An end plate is welded to the end of the beam and is bolted through the flange of the column. End this was full depth end plate. If I use a partial depth end plate, then it will transfer only shear and it will allow rotation. But here, because it was full depth end plate, so it will be kind of a little bit of semi rigid joint. The end plate beam to beam connection is similar to the beam to column end plate connection. However, because the top flanges of the beam support floors or roof structures directly. Now this is the notch, the one that you see over here in this figure, this is notch. Flange at the end of the incoming beam has to be notched. An alternative detail is to provide a projecting welded bracket or plate on the supporting beam. Adjustment is similar to the beam to column detail. This rigid or moment connection connects the web of the beam to the column through bolts and the flanges of the beam to the column by welding. With this connection, the beam cannot rotate unless the attached column also rotates. Now here you can see that it is the same double web cleated joint, but we are just welding the gap. When you weld the gap, it will turn it into a rigid joint. This is full depth end plate joint. And then you can see that we have these stiffeners as well at the end. These resistance table, these are taken from old version of moment connection. Now we have a new version. So please have a look at the new version to see what changes are there. So simply without actually designing them, we can use these re resistance tables in green books to come up with the design of these joints. This is a simple joint, first one. And then you can see that it is taking very little moment. It is having lots of rotation. Although in real life, it will take very less moment. When you apply loading over here, you can see that it can rotate here. It will take very little moment, like one or two kN meter. If the capacity, moment capacity of the beam is 400 kN meter, this will only take one or two kN meter, which is quite less. Then you have this second one, which is semi rigid joint. You can see that semi rigid joints can take quite a lot moment. Their rotation is quite less. They develop quite a lot of moment here. Their rotation is far less than simple joints. And then we have third one, that is the rigid one. So rigid one will have a lot of moment without having any rotation. So these are three simple semi-rigid and rigid joints and we call them as full strength as well. So first nominally pinned and then we have semi-rigid and then we have fully rigid. Eurocode it links three types of framing to three types of global analysis method. So we have simple method, we have semi-continuous and we have continuous and then it has got a classification process as well so, but I will not go through details of the classification. So th this is the classification of joints. It can be classified by stiffness or by strength. Again this is giving you idea of what model can be applied for different analysis simply have a look at that now design of simple joints whenever you are designing a joint you need to satisfy some of the requirements now this is the plate bolted to your column and then it is attached to your beam the direction of shear is this one i have this e1 distance which is from the center line of the bolt to the end of the plate and then i have this p1 distance which is pitch wherever you see this E1 and P1, they are in the direction of loading, in the direction of shear, which in case of a beam is like this. Now here end plate is welded to the beam and then it is attached to the column. And in bolted joints, how do we decide about the position of holes? And this is how we decide about position of holes. Perpendicular to the direction of force transfer, we have this E2. P2 is again pitch between two holes, not in the direction of the load transfer. In the direction of load transfer, it is E1. What is E1? E1 is the end distance which is equal to 1.2 times D0. This is the minimum one. You can have more than that. You have edge distance which is this distance. Its minimum has to be 1.2 times the diameter of the hole. Then we have this spacing P1 which is the pitch 2.2 times D0. Spacing P2 is 2.4 D0 where D0 is the diameter of the hole. Now these are the minimum dimensions. You can have 
more values than this. Now, how does this joint fail? Failure mode. The formula has been devised based on the failure mode. So whenever shear loading is applied at the joint, now what could be possible failure modes? My next question would be that what is the most desirable failure, plate or bolt? So bolt failure is sudden failure. Plate failure is a gradual failure. The name for plate failure is bearing failure. The name for bolt failure is bolt shear. So shear will happen in bolts. First failure is related to failure of bolt. By all means, we try to avoid failure of bolt because failure of bolt is catastrophic and it can lead to sudden failure. The first failure is failure in bolt. Now, how does it look like? When the bolts are threaded, then we have this formula. If bolts are not threaded, then we have other formula as well, but it's not listed here. But most of the time we will have threaded bolts. How does it fail? It will fail like this. Now you can see that something is happening with the bolt and then it suddenly snaps through. So when it suddenly snaps through, it means that this is quite catastrophic failure. The formula is very simple. Formula is simply stress times area of the bolt. And what is area of the bolt? Area of the bolt is the net area of the bolt. It's the usable area of the bolt because the bolt has threads. So that's why we say that it is only 78% of the area of the bolt is being utilized. Here we have gamma M2. Gamma M2 is 1.25. Gamma M2 is a safety factor. And alpha V is again a factor which varies depending on the bolt plate. If you're using 8.8, .8, then alpha V is going to be 0.6. The second one is bearing. Bearing always happens in plates. Means that plate bears against the bolt and resultantly failure is going to happen. And how does this failure look like? I want you to have a look at this video. Or you can term it as plate shear as well. Plate shear or bearing is the same thing. Now, this is mainly controlled by these edge and end distances. FPRD means bearing resistance. You have K1, alpha B, FU, DT over gamma M0. Now, because this is a plate failure, everything that we are considering here is related to the plate. DT diameter times thickness is simply the area around bolt. Gamma M2 is a factor and FU is the ultimate tensile strength. But of what? This is tensile strength of plate. What is alpha B and what is K1? Now, alpha B and K1 will depend on these factors. So, alpha B has to be minimum of these three things. Alpha B for inner bolt. Inner bolts will always have more bearing resistance because your outer bolts are going to fail first. Alpha B for end, you will work out alpha B for inner and whatever is the minimum, just choose the, the minimum. And again here, P1 is the pitch in the direction of shear transfer, minus 1 over 2. And then FUB is the ultimate strength of bolt and FU is ultimate strength of plate, 30 and 1. So whatever minimum value you are getting here, that will be your alpha B. Other factors K1, they are related to perpendicular to the direction of load transfer. So you work out these different values. Now I have talked about two things. One is bolt can fail, other is plate can fail. Plate failure is termed as bearing failure. This is always desirable that a plate fails. Then this is the reason that for steel, normally we use S275 steel. We're using grade 8.8 .8 bolt. Means that ultimate is 800, yield is 640. That is nearly double of your plate grade. And the reason being that we want to ensure that plate fails. If you like, you can check block tearing as well. So block tearing is again another type of failure. For systematic bolt group, this happens in a bolt group where we have this concentric loading. The design tearing resistance of the bolt is given by this formula. Then you need to check this third thing as well, where you have block of bolts, where failure happens due to block tearing mode. And I will show you what does it mean by block tearing. And where a and t is the net area subjected to tension a and v is the net area subjected to, to shear so have a look at this have a look mode one and then mode two
other mode 3. Welded joints, so if you have welded joints, then you can find out these formulas. So simplified design method for fillet wheels is that FWED is the design value of weld per unit. FWRD is the design resistance per length. So FWRD is equal to FVWD into A, where FVWD is the design shear strength of the weld, and A is the effective throat thickness which is given in this figure. How do we work it out? So here we need A, A is already there, and F, V, W, D comes from this formula. F, U is the minimum ultimate tensile strength of the connected parts divided by under root three. B, W is the correlation factor, it comes from this table where you have for S, 275 you have 0.85 for s355 you have 